I've been studying effigies, as Elizabeth said, and it's uh, totally a hobby of mine, um, which I had a passion for studying knights in armour, as Elizabeth said, up to 1500. Uh, we'll perhaps go into more of that, but uh, I should be reading off a script because there's so much to get through. I don't want to get lost in this such a vast subject. The statements that I make during my talk are purely my own thoughts. Others may have different ideas of the cross-legged effigy. I wish to acknowledge the help over the years during my studies in church monuments, the late Nick Norman and Claude Blair, who were former presidents of the society and were my mentor and friends. Over many years I've studied church monuments, I get asked various questions. Because the effigy is cross-legged, does this mean he was a crusader and went to the Holy Land? And because his feet is resting on a lion, did he die in battle? Or is his feet on a dog? Does this mean he died at home? Much of this talk stems from church guidebooks and notices placed together with the effigy. One such church at Castle Coombe in Wiltshire has stuck in my memory for a long time, as the information in the church states that because the leg is crossed, he went on two crusades. Because of this information, people get mixed messages and therefore ask, is it true? I do acknowledge that for some, they already know the answers and can find this repetitive, but for others, they may wish to know the history and background of this story. It is not intended here to talk about the history of church monuments, which is a very complex, but only to address some talked about issues. More specific talks may come at a later date. There are 450 three-dimensional cross-legged effigies, which can be found scattered all over England, with some in Wales, Ireland, and two in Scotland. How do I know this? Apart from those in Ireland, I've seen them all. It is worth mentioning that the cross-legged effigy is not confined to knights, as there is a cross-legged effigy female at Howden, East Yorkshire, three at Cashel in Ireland and some civilians, for instance, Burke in West Yorkshire. Also, some of the earliest knightly brasses, like here at Charlton, are also cross-legged. As far as I'm aware, all modern scholars accept the cross-legged theory, and I include myself. But when did the cross-legged crusader myth start? And what is the possible source? Was it new or was it borrowed from someone else? From the 18th century onwards, there was the question, did cross-legged effigies represent Knight Templars and of high rank? In 1772, Smart Luthenia wrote that all cross-legged effigies were vulgarly called Knight Templars, and he did not know of a single effigy that was beyond date commemorated by such an effigy. The earliest printed book on church monuments, published in 1631 by John Weaver, really records monuments in churches in London and the southeast. When he visited the Temple Church, London, which was found by the Order of the Templars, he states, There are in this temple many very ancient monuments of famous men, shaped in marble, armed, their legs crossed, their names not to be gathered, by any inscription for that time has worn them out. So there's no mention of these effigies representing crusaders. And if he thought they were crusaders, surely he would have stated it. Knights Templars did not have any possessions and therefore never buried in armour, so they could not have been commemorated by knightly effigies. It has also been remarked that cross legs represents the cross as a symbol of the crusades. The first mention of cross legged crusaders was by Stowe in his survey of London in 1598, but he does not give his reasoning for such wording. The crusades were a form of religious war between the Latin church, trying to conquer the Holy Land from the Islamic church between 1096 to 1271. The earliest knightly effigies probably date from between 1225 to 50. And here at Alkerton, Warwickshire, is a very early example, perhaps early 1200s.
Also, Salisbury is an early example representing William Longsby, who died in 1226. Note that the legs are straight, and if placed upright, he would look like as if he was a standing statue rather than a recumbent effigy. It is thought that the sculptors working on the Wells West Front at Wells Cathedral were responsible for this fine effigy as seen here on these statues. At first, effigies were upright statues and laid down horizontally. Also at the Temple Church London, is a straight-legged effigy thought to represent William Marshall, who died in 1219. When these early effigies were being produced, the Crusades were coming to a close. So why would the sculptors go from producing straight-legged effigies to cross-legged? I don't know how many English people took part in the Crusades in the early part of the 13th century, but it must have been a fraction compared to those from the continent. Also, I don't believe local knights of the Shire could afford to crusade, and especially when knights were summoned to fighting conflicts in England, like the Barons' War. About 1220 is when we start seeing cross-legged effigies, uh, probably introduced by sculptors from the west, the west of England, which continue with this form of representation until 1350. Here you can see there are hands holding the knight's head here, which is really interesting, that is. Um, the early form of the hands holding the head up, which I'll go into in more detail shortly. Here at Bryce Norton, Oxfordshire is a semi effigial effigy. So it's not all represented by three dimensional. There are some isolated instances cross-legged figures towards the end of the 14th century, like here at Dorchester and into the 16th century. But these must be examples that represent an old fashioned image of a knight rather than the current rigid straight leg knight. At first effigies were upright statues and laid down and then afterwards laid down horizontally. The reason why effigies progress from straight-legged, statue-like, is to make it livelier, more in agreement with reality and lifelike. It is clear that once they were cross-legs, very soon every knightly effigy followed the fashion of the day. There are a small number of cross-legged effigies in Spain, perhaps with English influence. Therefore, this is purely a United Kingdom phenomenon. It is not confined to funerary monuments, but also staying on statue figures on the west front of Wells Cathedral, but these are represented as seated. It may be asked, is there any mention of effigies being specified in contracts or wills? Unfortunately, no contract survived from this period, which we are talking about, and it's not until we get to the late 14, early 15th centuries that contracts survive and specifies what is asked for in a contract. The way the legs are crossed does not give any bearing for this talk, and apart from a small number, all are from different workshops. It may be that the legs are crossed across the knees and others across the ankles, but the outcome is still the same, cross-legged. The sculptors who carved these effigies would have been very proficient in statue imagery, working on monastic buildings, so if they would have turned that hand to carbon effigies also. There's not a set pattern as to how an effigy should be carved. Therefore, the various counties across England and Wales have different styles. The only places that we can group effigies together stylistically are from the so-called Westminster workshop and a group also from Yorkshire. I'll just pause on this so people can have a look. Because I've got a lot of pictures here to show. These are the ones in Yorkshire, which are related. The way that the male is represented is regional. The way that the male is represented is either realistically carved with the links that are linked to each other, 
composition links or incised parallel rows of seas. As a rule, effigies in the eastern part of England, from Northumberland to Lincolnshire and across to the East Midlands, we find the carved realistic mail, whereas from Cumbria down the central belt and across the West Country, it is the parallel rows of seas. That's the way the mail is carved down the legs and across the arms. Of course, there are those where composition linked mail featured also, which I'll go into in a minute. It is worth looking at some of the variations with the legs being crossed. And here at Braunston, this is a very interesting effigy with, with figures here. And uh, there's got a gablet at the top. Um, the legs are crossed high up. And here we have the effigy at Gloucester. And the, the, the legs here really sort of um, what you might call a sort of um, a lively pose, really. But I'll mention this effigy in a short while also. Um, Temple Church, another what, what is a very lively effigy. Um, for those who don't know, it's worth commenting that the Temple Church effigies have been restored on a, on a few occasions. And Richardson, in the 19th century, he, he restored them. But the most severe damage was done in the Second World War, when the last night of the Blitz, a bomb fell on the church and the effigies were covered originally with sleepers, I think railway sleepers, to stop them being damaged. And the sleepers caught fire and they were burnt, severely damaged. So from that point, we lost a, a, lot, of, a lot of great artwork. Um, here we have a really fabulous effigy at uh, Oldworth. Um, the way these legs are crossed the eights. And the, the, this side here originally would have, his head would have been propped up by his right, his right hand. And a very famous effigy, although it's very damaged, but it is very unusual. Cross legged, you can see here. Um, and he's got really interesting armor. Anyone who's studying arms and armor, this is one to go and look at. The armor is superb, very detailed as well. The, the, the helmet as well, which, which comes down right down the shoulders, the, the, like a sort of a guard here. And these arms would have had, uh, you know, sort of cannon pieces, like gutter shaped plates. Absolutely superb one, that is. At Furness Abbey, Lancashire, there are two very interesting effigies who wear flat top helms with their swords being held upright. Um, this one, the slower one here, you can see the knight's lying on his side and the sword is there running up there. Those are very interesting ones they are. You don't really often see the eff you know, effigies that have got helms, especially, you know, there's, there's not many around. At Herworth on Tees in Durham, is made. this one's made of a locally made uh, frostily limestone, it's like a, like a perfect polishable limestone. And here you can see that he's holding a sword there. This, although this, eff this effigy's got heraldry, it's, it's not identifiable apparently. Well, I don't think it is, but others may have other opinions on it. Top one at Beer Ferrers, Devon, is a very unusual reclining posture. He's, um, he's really sort of, this is, this is sort of typical sort of, there's a, quite a few of these in Devon and um, quite a sort of unusual cross leg pose. Whereas the one at the bottom, he, he holds the edge of the edge of the shield there. Um, there's not many of those effigies holding the shield edge. Why he's holding it is another thing, but uh, there's a, there are others, but can't recall offhand where they are. While I have illustrated life-size cross-legged effigies, you must not forget a small number of miniature examples. So here at Botsford, Botsford on the right and Tembury Wells on the left. 
the example at Tetbury Wells is holding a, his heart or a heart and it's, it's thought to represent the heart burial and some full-size effigies that also hold the heart as well so the, these are I forget the length of this one but it it's only it's only about two foot long it's really small um and also Botsford's lost its lost its lower legs as quick as the cross-legged effigy become fashionable it was a place with the original concept effigy with his legs straight between 1345 to 50 is when we start seeing the gradual phasing out of cross-legged effigies but why as effigies were made by various sculptors, each would have, each would have carried out producing cross-legged effigies for a while or lesser until they all stopped. Did England look to the fashion of the day on the continent? This I doubt, as we never looked for them for the inspiration of the cross-legged cross attitude. What is evident, effigies were being carved more in the rain with the legs being undercut. For instance, here at Le Campstead in Buckinghamshire. And also at Cleehonga, Herefordshire. Do we know of any effigy where the person commemorated went on a crusade? Yes, we do. Robert Courthouse, who was the son of King William I, and went to the Holy Land in 1096. He was buried in Gloucester Cathedral and has an effigy which is thought to represent him. The effigy dated 1280 to 1300 is not reliably genuine and was recorded as broken in many pieces and restored in 1501. So if it does represent Corthos, it is a retrospective example. Also, Sir Robert de Vere a Sudbury, Northamptonshire, who's reported to have died while crusading in Egypt in 1250. Half of the effigies from the period are represented either in drawing their swords from the scabbard, like here, on this hypo-energetic effigy at Dorchester, Oxfordshire, or simply with their right hand resting on the pommel. Like here on the left. These are interesting effigies. It's resting. There's not as this one on the right. He's you, you can see he saw he's drawing his sword. This one at Braunston, because you can see just there. You can, my cursor is on the mouse. You can see part of the scabbard with a. It's got a fuller running down it, a narrow groove. So he's actually drawing his sword from it. With his hand. You can see that he's pulling it away. But on the left here is at. Um, Stop Gaylord, he's actually just holding the scabbard his left, but he's actually his, 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 right, his right hand is resting on top of the pommel. So he isn't he isn't there drawing a sword, he just say you could say sword handling. The other half of the effigies have their hands held in prayer, but this feature is not seen before 1280 and will be seen as devotional. A very interesting mamble in Worcestershire has his arms at the side of the body. A unique occurrence from this period. Splendid effigy, this one. The late politician Enoch Powell had a theory. When a knight stepped forward to engage his foe, drawing his sword, he would have had his legs crossed. He, he, he spoke on that on the conference, on the early church knight society conferences. He actually, Enoch Powell, he actually very knowledgeable on Effigies actually. People ask the question why does an effigy have their feet resting on a lion? Did he die in battle? Lions have been represented in sculpture, art, armour, and heraldry from the early part of the Middle Ages. One may wonder whether the craftsman had ever seen a, lo a lion in real life, as some examples are bizarre. The artisans working in London may presumably have seen lions at the Tower of London and would have had first-hand experience of what they look like, whereas those working at centres away from London, for instance, in Lincolnshire, Herefordshire and Somerset, may have only seen them in drawings. Edward II is recorded as having a lion at the Tower. The lion is by far the most common image at the feet of military effigies, 
with the dog represented on females, but there's no set pattern as lions and dogs are found on both. The reason why lions are represented on monuments remains open to interpretation. And many theories are circulated about this. Harry Thomas remarked that the lion may be a symbol of the resurrection derived from the legend in which the lion roars or licks his stillborn cubs to life. MD Anderson comments that when lion a lion fights a dragon, it's good over evil. The late Jerome Bertram commented that the presence of a lion footrest almost certainly derives from Psalm 91, verse 13 of the Bible. Thou shalt tread upon a lion and adder, the young lion and dragon, shalt they trample under feet. In fact, these two preceding verses explain to him why angels are represented holding cushions on which the effigies rest their heads. For, thee, for he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest they dash their foot against a stone. Also in Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion, walk about seeking whom he may devour. Therefore, the military effigy in the church was seen as God's faithful warrior. The lion may have been actually represented as evil being trampled underfoot. The instance of the lion seeking someone to devour may be cited on the early effigy at Tilton on the Hill, Leicestershire, where the lion is holding a man's severed head in his front paws, clawing at the open mouth. The earliest of nine effigies in the Temple Church, London, has pushed his sword into the back of the lion's head and through its mouth. You can see, um, you can see the, the, the sword going through here, but these were, again, these were damaged in the war. So I've, I've put these drawings in from Richardson to illustrate, you can see it better. The powerful iconography of the late 13th and early 14th centuries became watered down as the century passed until by the 15th centuries, the lions by comparison are playful, while still retaining some of their Christian significance. In later years, the lion may have been present purely as a decorative feature and as a convenience to support the feet. There is one interesting church in Yorkshire known as the Man and Cat Church, Spamborough where the legend has been passed down for many generations. A knight called Sir Percival Cressaker was returning to his home at Bambra Hall when he was sat upon by a wild cat that landed on the back of, the, of his horse, which threw its rider off. And the cat then set a paint about Sir Percival. They fought to the death where Sir Percival crushed the cat against the porch wall of the church. And such were the injuries that a red stain is visible on the porch floor. So there are many tales that have been passed down through generations that have ended in guidebook and publications. Occasionally you find some oddities as footrests, like here at Old Summerby in Lincolnshire, where the knight has his feet resting on a, a kneeling saddle horse that has been held by an esquire. Unfortunately, it's, it's damaged in the squire's ear and the horse's head has also gone. Here at Minster Sheppey in Kent, the effigy has his feet resting on the squire with the head of a horse on his right. I'm just about to see the head of a horse there. Uh, that's a very new representation. I, I haven't got a clue what's going on there, to be honest with you. There's some legend as well. There's some legend which has been wrote down, but it's too con. It's too long to repeat it here. Also to be noted, he reclines on his left with his sword and shield under his body. You can just about see the sword there. We've got a spear there as well. And uh, the sword going under his body, under, under that way. Once an effigy was carved, a very important feature was then to paint and gild the surface. Apart from perhaps exterior monuments, 
what we see today are, are the only is the only material that what the effigy is made from. And all vestiges of colour have disappeared over time. The wooden effigy to Baron John Hastings at Abergavenny Priory, conserved between 1994 and 1998, has revealed some very interesting paint analysis that highlights what effigies would it look like, whether it was wood or stone. Although not visible to the naked eye, the whole surface was covered with small nails or pins spaced at rele relevant distances from each other. These have been suggested to be the setting out guides for when the effigy was carved, uh, rather than being used to hold down something like a layer of cloth. The whole effigy would have been covered in a substance known as gesso, which was a base layer made of chalk and animal glue and used to fill any blemishes. To achieve the effect of chain mail, a putty was made that was compressed into tin foil. It was then cut and attached to the surface of the effigy. The tin gave the appearance of raised mail. This technique was used on majority of effigies where the carving of mail was not used. The whole surface would have been gilded and with paint that reflected with the colours of heraldry, armour, types of cloth and flesh. It's worth, this is at Walter Perry in Oxfordshire, and you can see this, this effect of um, impressed mail, which would have been attached to the stone, and you can see it, it remains on this effigy. So the, uh, this, part, this part is armour here, whereas you can see under the arm, you can see this chain mail. And that again would have been added to the stone. Although only fragments of colour remain on the Hastings effigy, which can only be seen under laboratory uh, conditions, it does give us a clue as to what effigies look like. There are a few nights where the original colour remains, like here in Westminster Abbey, but the surface has been ruined by the restorer who applied a layer of varnish that has discovered over time, discolored over time. Yeah, splendid. You can see the, you can see the, what heraldry there, you see where my cursor is, that, obviously that's represented in this drawing by Charles Stottard, but it's all discolored. And this effigy would have also been covered in a gesso. Um, I'm not sure what date it was, but there was a fire in the Abbey, I think it was an arson attack. And uh, it was one and near one of these effigies, and it caused some damage and, on one of these effigies, and it 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 actually um, melted some of the melted melted some of the gesso, which is like so. You knew that these effigies were cut, you know, made of this putty substance. So that's quite interesting. A very good example is here at Rampton in Cambridgeshire, the famous antiquarian Charles Stottard who in the early part of the 19th century recorded and published what colours he found. Since his visits to churches, most of his findings have been worn away, even by zealous cleaners. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I had a tale from Nick Norman. He went to a, a church, I don't know where it was, I forget now, but he was talking to the lady and uh, he said, oh, he, I think Claude Blair was with him. And, and uh, I think Nick said to Claude, Oh, look, Claude, there's some original paint, and the lady says, Oh, I missed, I missed to clean that off. So that's what I mean by zealous cleaners. <laughs> uh, the one question that people ask are these facial features portraits of the person commemorated? Although certain Victorian authors believe that some 13th century effigies are portraits, but the early period that we are talking about, nightly features, are, are very stereotyped and purely the sculptor's personal design. Some are represented wearing moustaches, while the vast majority are clean shaven. The eyes are open as if living and alert. Upon the death of a person in the Middle Ages, it is thought that an effigy of the deceased was placed on top of the coffin with a mask made of either wax or plaster. If the mask was actually taken from the deceased, we don't know. But much later in the Middle Ages, death masks were actually done for royalty, 
who were buried in Westminster Abbey, of which some survive. A funeral effigy of Edward III, made of wood and hollowed at the back, with the arms forming an integral part of the effigy, does survive. The hands were added separately, but it was carved in the rough as it would have been covered with robes and attachments. The face was made of a mixture of plaster and linen and was added to the effigy and painted. Expert analysis carried out in 1952 revealed it could only be a death mask from the late king after he had died. There is documentary evidence for real life death masks in the 14th century, but Edward, the, Edward III is the first surviving example. My belief is that true portraits of knights did not occur until the 15th century, like here at Norbury in Derbyshire. We don't actually know for certain if the effigy was carved and painted at a workshop or carved at the destination church. Here at Grossmont in Monmouthshire is an unfinished effigy with X marks that show it was being roughed out. So we know that effigies were carved in the church by local sculptors or traveling artisans. Large workshops would have transported effigies to the destination using rivers, carts and by sea. While we have a large number of cross-legged effigies in our churches, we do not know who carved them. While one would expect that they were carved by artisans working in, in this country, we can't discount, discount sculptors from Europe finding work in this country. I mentioned earlier the Westminster workshop. This is a term I use when we can group those effigies that are related to examples in Westminster Abbey. The effigies in Westminster Abbey are of fine quality, and one would expect that the best sculptors would have commissioned that they would have been commissioned to do the work. It is known, it is unknown, sorry, which master mason was responsible for carving the effigies, but the surname of Canterbury appears to have been associated with building work at the Abbey from the late 13th century until the 1330s. The first master mason that, of, of that name appears to have been Michael, actively employed as a royal mason between 1275 to 1321 on various work. His successor was Walter of Canterbury, 1319 to 1327. Supporting, supporting Walter was Thomas of Canterbury, 1323 to 1335. While these masons worked on the Abbey, we don't know what influence they had with monuments, but William Ramsay III, active 1323 until his death in 1349, is very like the person who carved the effigy of John of Eltham. To conclude, when visiting rural parish churches, the cross-legged effigy can be found, which conjures a romantic image of knights of old. These effigies represent local landed gentry, knights of the shire, sheriffs who attended parliament, and in return for owning land from the king, they were summoned to perform military service, perhaps in Scotland, Wales, or overseas. These effigies are idealistic and realistic, and when placed in their church and viewed by the congregation near the high altar, they show a family reputation as lords of the manor and prayers would have been asked for the deceased. The head is turned looking towards the high up the altar, but also displaying his chivalric status in life. While scholars try and unravel these mysteries of how monuments are displayed and viewed, but what we don't know is 800 years ago, what went through the medieval mind? Who created these effigies? what their beliefs were and their conclusions.